If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, oh. for the first 46 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. Talk I about s- some rice cakes. We first talked, started talking <laughs> about Thrive Market's uh, rice cakes. Oh, that's not true. That's not how we started. Yeah, well, well, well. But Thrive Market <laughs> is the largest online retailer of non-GMO organic products. Super, super good prices. Like if you make non-GMO organic foods a priority, you need to shop at Thrive Market. You will save a ton of money. We are sponsored by Thrive Market, and we've also got a special uh, pro, uh, discount for all of our listeners. So if you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump, you're going to get one month free membership, $20 off your first three orders of $49 or more, and free shipping. Hook up. Then we talk about my new split workout and map split. Remember, map split is out this month. We talk about taking a critical look at all the MAPS fitness products. We talk about Mind Pump's free resources, overeating during breastfeeding study. Actually found in a mouse study that uh, mice that overate while breastfeeding uh, resulted in obese pups who also went through puberty early. Kind of fascinating. And we talked about the decline and resurgence of fast food. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, How do we know when it's time to change up our routines and continue progressing? In other words, when is it time to change your adaptation? Before you hit a plateau, when you hit a plateau, how many weeks? Like, what does that look like? The next question was, how do we deal with constant self-hate? This particular individual is constantly putting themselves down after any mistake they make. Sounds like it's uh, taking a toll on their quality, quality of life. What is our advice The next question was, as a personal trainer, what makes them more marketable? Years of experience or multiple personal training certifications? Good discussion here. And the last question is, will your body and metabolism adapt to excess amounts of NEAT in the same way that it adapts to cardio? Like we're comparing NEAT to cardio. Which one's better for the metabolism and which one's better for everything else? Good discussion in that part of this episode. Also, I do want to remind everybody, MAPS Split is out. It is the first split bodybuilding program that we have written in MAPS style. We addressed all the common problems with traditional split routines like intensity, like when do you use intensity, when is it too much, when is it too little, frequency, how many times per week should I train each body part and how should I split them up. Uh, phasing or periodization, like how do I phase my workout so my body continues to progress? Now, MAP Split is an advanced routine, so if you've got some experience, especially if you're a competitor or you want to compete, it's a 12-week program, so it's perfect for contest prep. It's also discounted right now because we're right in the middle of the launch that ends on June 10th, so whenever if you're listening to this, look at your calendar, June 10th, this sale is over. You get $50 off, plus you get the free Map split T-shirt. That's right. It's uh, the code is split fifty for fifty dollars off, and we did want to offer something to someone to the people who are more like beginners or people who don't have access to a gym. We have a program called Maps Anywhere. That program is half off, not fifty dollars off, half off. So we took the total price, cut it in half. Uh, you can find Maps Anywhere at mindpumpmedia.com. Maps Split is found at mapssplit.com, and don't forget use the code split fifty. Until June 10th to get the free t-shirt and $50 off. That promotion will be ending soon. Asian booty. <laughs> oh, yeah. Show me them rice cakes. Show me them rice cakes, girl. <laughs> is that what that is? Yeah. Rice cakes or Asian booties? Can we do that? I don't Let's know. Do that. Can, we? Can we make that a thing? No. no. Why? You just Maybe. Can't. Why do we have to be so PC, dude? We're mind pumped. I don't know. You know, you know what I was wearing yesterday? I'm what? bringing it back, too. It's actually cool now because it's getting faded because I've watched it so many times. Is the original zero fuck shirt? You're gonna mm. wear that? I'm bringing it Rocket back. It. I'm bringing it back, dude. <clears throat> you, we, I I've went, seen homeless guys. With so it on, here's the thing. I went through. I went through this little, like when we first did it. Yeah, you know zero fucks. Then I went through this period. Where I was just like, what the fuck are we thinking? <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. You know. Like, where can you even wear that? Where is that appropriate? Like, only maybe in the yeah, gym. Yeah, but it doesn't say fuck. It says f asterisks. 
uh, CKS. It's, it's pretty it in your said, face. Dude. It says Fox. Yeah, it zero. Does say fox. There's the no, you read there. it. There's, there's not fox. even a kid that can read doesn't go like. I wonder what that means. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be zero facts. <laughs> no, oh, it could be no. zero. Nothing. That's not how Folks, you read it no, at all. Not at all. Yeah, right. So, th- so my point is, facts. all four of us were wearing that at Adam Show. I remember that. That was we that did was hilarious. We did. Yeah. <laughs> so I went through Walking this. Around so like I've gone through this phase, right? So I went through the. <laughs> it was a brilliant idea. I loved it. And then I thought, like, what a stupid idea. And then now I've and now like and I don't nostalgic. Know, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know if it's because it's nostalgic now or what. But now I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, this is kind of cool because it. I pulled it out and I was wearing it and I was like, it but was you're ser- too corporate now, maybe. right? It served me as it served <clears throat> served to me as a reminder of our core audience that has been with us, you know, since day one. You know, they appreciated that message. Sure, uh, you know, a zero fucks T shirt isn't going to make us rich, like uh, like obviously. But I, I think the message behind that, that, you know, we were going to, a lot of the decisions that we made have that zero fucks kind of attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and I now, where the growth and where we're at with the, the company now, I catch myself with these moments of like, oh, maybe we shouldn't say that. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Or how are people going to receive this? And then so it served to me yesterday as this reminder of this zero fucks mentality so if you say something funny because we have rice cakes in front of us right now that like yeah. hey rice cakes that could be like an asian hot booty right now oh my like, god <laughs> i'm gonna fucking say it because i think it's hilarious i think that's so funny and it's it like is. if someone's gonna get offended by that like yeah. fuck off like i don't want you listening to the show anyways like that's how i feel what would yeah. you call it what would you call italian booty Mm. Italian booty. I don't know. I'm asking you guys. You know, you're the one that came up with the. You're the one that came up with that one. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. A t- well, like, cakes. We know what cakes are. I mean, like I've been panini. calling. Yeah. I've, what uh, did you? <laughs> panini cakes. Yeah. yeah. Panini cake. <laughs> right. Yeah. Rigatoni yeah. cake. Look at look at them lasagna cakes. Yeah. <laughs> I've been saying cakes for a long time to in to refer to butt. Right. Mm. I like that. I like yeah. saying cakes. cakes. It just <laughs> tasty cakes. And to be honest with you, I don't know where I heard that. And is that a thing? I don't know. I does anybody I, else? Does anybody else? Pretty sure it's a thing. To say cakes mm. for butt? Yeah, I mean, I've seen it on Instagram. Like, you know, people like refer to their posterior region as cakes. Do they really? Yeah. Oh, so I didn't make that up? No. <laughs> no, you thought that, oh, you thought that I was thought your I thing? I invented that. No, uh, no, no, I've heard that before. Is this, oh, okay. is this your favorite brand right here? I've never even used that brand before. Oh, uh, uh, what is it? Lugberg Farms or whatever? Lundberg. Lundberg. Lundberg yeah, I'm looking I got, right I at got that from Thrive Market. I know. I, I've never had it before. Is it good? It's organic, and I do. You know what I use rice cakes for? Here, pass me over. I want to try huh? one. Can I try one? Can I have one? Or are yeah, you like? A, no, you don't. Give you're fuck stingy. One. Can you have? Come on. I should. Like, you, know, you know how I'm pissed. You know how, <laughs> you know how pissed off everybody gets when I eat on the show. You know what I'm saying? It's been a, oh, when you oh eat on the show, yeah, it's been a long time. Man, this is gonna be a throwback. See has, start. Right, see if it has a good crunch to it. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Oh wow. Mm. There, wow. Now we've just we've just annoyed. These are, these are fantastic. We've just annoyed all the auditory. God, there's a term for it. My girlfriend has this issue where. There's certain one sounds, more, more mouth noises, mm. that will drive people crazy, and there's a term for it. It's like a psychological term, and I can't remember it. I can't remember what it it's is. It's like nails on a chalkboard for some people. Yes, just the mm. mouth noises. Mm. Uh, but anyways, I use rice cakes as a conduit. So I'm not. I don't typically. Now you just saw me eat rice cakes plain. A conduit, like for electricity. Yeah. No. Yeah, so no, they don't. No, they don't. The they wires. don't conduct electricity yeah. very well. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, what you as a conduit con- for uh, like butter, peanut butter, like it's just a carrying. Does that word work vehicle. there? What does that conduit work there for that? I feel like it does. I don't. Yeah, Doug, does that work? Oh, oh, there you go, misophonia. Misophonia. Oh, that's a that's oh, a that's term. The yeah, this is annoyance a, uh, of mouth sounds. Yeah, it's a condition where people just. Chewing, chomping, slurping, gurgling can send them into a instantaneous blood boiling rage. Wow, that's a real. I have thing. a really low dose of that. You do? Yeah, For I what can't sound? stand when people smack and they eat. I uh, agree. I don't know. It's, it's does it piss you off? Me. A little bit, but not like like I said, a very mm. small dose. Mm. I'm actually a really quiet eater when I eat. It's just that when you chew something in front of this microphone, it obviously it. Are I'm you? A, I am. It exaggerates it. I'm trying to think. Are you a quiet eater? Yeah. Is Justin? <laughs> yeah, I every, am actually. You every, know, I'm just I'm sloppy. Everybody. Yeah, that's uh, the thing. We, Justin's you, sloppy. You're loud. I'm sloppy, but when I'm I eat, not I'm loud. loud. Yes, yes. Mm. you're a smacker for mm-hmm. sure, bro. Mm-hmm. That's. I, there's certain foods I can't eat with you, dude. Really? Yeah. Pay attention. I think You'll a, lot see, of a lot of times too, I'll get up like and I'll slurping. move away from you. I don't even say anything to you because I know it's your Italian culture the way you guys eat, dude. It's like <laughs> slurping <laughs> shit all. That's actually true. It is true. That's actually true. There's noodles. That's why I know. That's why I don't. I mean, I used to kind of give you shit. I don't know if you remember, but then I just 
just gave up on it. I'm like, well, it's not, yeah. you know, yeah. I just, I'll just I'm an go. old dog. It's not, oh. nothing's going to change. I, so I go eat next to Doug. Because yeah. if I eat next to you, I got to listen to you in my ear. If <laughs> I eat next to Doug? Justin, I might get, I might get some of it yeah, on. You're going to get some debris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. I sit next to Justin, you're going to fly and you're going to have leftovers. Yeah. Well, have the some. times I've had to sleep in the same room with you, it's payback because you snore like a, you snore like you're dying. I always snore at like when I'm away. Bro, you literally, you literally. That's hilarious. It sounds like someone's choking you while you're sleeping. Like. <laughs> I'm like, he's gonna fucking die! Oh my god, somebody attack him, bro! One night, when does the, it really sound? Oh like that? my god, dude! When we went to L.A. back when you had your Achilles, uh, when it was torn, right? I feel like and that has something to do with on medication and, or something. Yeah, I'm on drugs. And let me, let me tell you. And let me tell you. If Justin, I snore like that. I'm on drugs. I, t- I took care yeah. of him the whole time when we were in L.A. With yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to like take him. Oh, you don't want to go anywhere. We stayed in the room the whole time. I know how it can be. I, I you know, I acted like it was cool. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> while he's while he's sleeping, I had anxiety all night because I'm like. Is he gonna die? And I start yeah. thinking of all the like how okay what do we, okay this is the host that we could replace him. I started thinking of all these different things we could do if he died right. because he literally would stop. At, it's like someone's choking him, <laughs> so it's payback. Yeah, no, but I Did am. You I like am, throw things on him just to, uh, you know get him out. No, of I just you know what I thought to myself. I'm like, well, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. No, I would have saved you, bro. Oh, I was waiting. I was like, I was count like when you stop breathing, like okay, one thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three. Turning blue, is he, is he, like shining your yeah. little phone light on him. Yeah. <laughs> feel <laughs> ah, skin, skin get, get a mirror up to his face, see if it fogs up. Okay, yeah. he's breathing. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> back to the 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 Lumberg rice cakes here. I'm always interested in how this strategy works for companies like this because I know that Thrive Market takes a page out of like um, Nutri Shops and companies like that. Those that aren't familiar with how they make a lot of their money is a supplement store will, you know, they will sell some of the top brands that are out there mm-hmm. and then where they make the real money and the margins in there are really bad, right? So you're buy, you have to buy from this big brand and they're, they're at wholesale, then you turn around and sell at retail mm-hmm. and they're probably only making cents, you know, on the dollar and when they sell those, where they make their big chunk of change is they create their own brand. Yeah, with with bigger margins. And they undercut the the, the big brands. Dude, you buy a full bag of mm-hmm. organic rice cakes through Thrive Market, two bucks. Wow. That's a full like, mm, I don't know. That's maybe like a dollar, uh, a dollar to dollar fifty less. Oh, almost fifty percent less. Yeah, that's and, crazy, dude. I'm telling you right now, like it's it's paradigm shattering. If you buy I want, you organic, know, healthy foods, mm-hmm. go through Thrive Market. Watch your your save fucking bill. Money. Yeah, you save a lot Quality of money. Stuff, not yeah. a little bit. It's not like you know, like oh, I don't save it. You actually save a lot of money enough to not only enough to cover your membership or whatever, yeah. way more than that. I mean, they're totally killing. So you the, just eat these without like I used to eat these with peanut butter like that used to be like a go-to for you know me. what i like to put on things what butter 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 on everything yeah. oh wow just straight butter. i've seen him at starbucks just eat like those packets of oh. butter like just why are you talking like shit because you did the same thing uh, i know i'm <laughs> gonna throw you into the bus first <laughs> yeah, what a dick we were at starbucks and i had a pat of butter and i'm like oh, i'm gonna eat this and i ate it and he's like yeah. i do that too and yeah. he ate the same thing i ate it too and yeah. we became best friends right away was, you know i tr- so back when i was you know super insecure about being skinny and i was trying anything and everything to put weight don't on. tell me you were just eating butter so that was the, i can't remember where i read <laughs> oh, that wow. I don't remember the first place I, I heard that, but that's like an old school bodybuilder tactic to, f- and so we, I would freeze butter cubes and then I would try, but I just I couldn't do it. Wait a minute. Oh, wait man. a minute. Hold, I never do you this. You must have ruined yourself from like Freeze too butter much. cubes and then eat them? Well, yeah. So, cause then it's just, the te- it changes the texture a little bit. So it's more like, it's not like this gooey, mushy, melted butter that you're trying to eat if you eat the soft kind that's from the Interesting. store. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's got a little, so you bite it. You can actually bite it so, when it's frozen. So here, so I, I'm a, I'm a massive a fan of butter. I can eat butter by itself. I can eat it on anything. I yeah. put butter on potato chips. It I'll is, put butter on crackers. Amazing. I'll put butter on, on potato fucking potato chips. Yep, wow. that just sounds like a heart attack. Do you put? Do you put? It doesn't actually. Do you put? <laughs> Me and Sal actually fight for butter. I've noticed when we yeah. go out to eat. Yeah, like, yeah. In the, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah we when fight we, for that butter. Yeah, yeah, you don't fuck around with the butter and no. salt. Right? The no, meal. I'll no. salt the fuck. You know what I think? He's, he's, he's worse on the salt. I yes. You know what I think it is too. I think it's part of it's like counter. To like what was been pitched to us for so long, and it's yeah, like, it's, it's almost like, like free reign. It's like, now. Yeah, it's yeah. like him making up for it. It's like fuck you. Tell me salt was bad yeah. for so many years. Like salting yeah. my butter. I'm salting everything. You didn't know anything. <laughs> Parents, I have a stick, a stick yeah. of butter, and I just throw salt all over it. <laughs> no, I, I, I like putting on. But yeah, butter on a potato chip. You put butter on potatoes. Why not put it on a potato chip? You know what I'm saying? Society hmm. fucking tells you what you can and can't well, do. I'm just, I'm just break the mold. I'm just thinking breaker. it's deep fried already that it doesn't need any more <laughs> grease yeah. or fat to it. It's I actually just, pretty good. 
Uh, but yeah, I, so here's a here's a delicious. Uh, I don't eat this anymore because I really don't eat bread. But if you want to try something that's different, that's uh, delicious. Instead of peanut butter and jelly sandwich, try a butter and jelly sandwich. I've it's actually that. you have. Yeah, I have done that. <laughs> Well, I could see that because I what I have Justin, I love you. But, butter and jelly just it's by fun, itself. It's yeah. fucking good though, I've right? That, well, yeah. I could I see that butter with like and peanut butter because I've had toast before, right? Butter I, and peanut butter. Have you done that? No. Oh, that's even better. Oh my god, that's it so makes good. It so much more. What creamy. are some other things we could put butter oh on? That's god. really good. I know, dude. You guys, <laughs> dude, are, between butter and bacon, like how I are fucking, you two not put on fat as fuck? I know, right? How are you not hella fat from that? Um, such dense calories. Moderate, you know, I do maps. flexible. I do the maps yeah. programs. <laughs> you know maps. Yeah. Great yeah. segue to a commercial, right? Yeah, here. You know, so tell okay. us about that new map split yeah, program that yeah, just released, yeah, Sal, dude. and how it counters all the butter eating. Dude, can I tell yeah, what you? A setup, Adam. Can yeah. I tell you? So I'm doing some of the map split workouts myself, yeah. and I haven't done a. I'm not even ready for them. How funny is that? <laughs> I'm embarrassed, right? I'm like, <laughs> we have this badass. Like, I helped to create this. Yeah. I'm not ready. I'm getting DMs, right? People are like, "How do you like the split program?" I'm like, "Well, uh, I'm." Kind of not there right now, yeah. but I keep it real. You know, it's just my volume of training is just not. You're there. starting in Maps Prime. No, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I am. That. I'm like this. It's like, intense. I'm like anywhere Prime flirting with anabolic right now. I'm just not. I, yeah. I just know better. But I, uh, there's a lesson there. I think for people, I think uh, you know mm. we were very careful about the order of how we uh, released programs for a reason. You know, as as much as selling a program on its intensity and soreness mm. and how it's going to make you feel like no doubt, like if you've never worked out before and you do map split versus maps anabolic and you are only gauging for two weeks, map split would show somebody more results in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Would it not? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that shit's intense and it's a lot yeah. of volume, dude. Oh, two if weeks. You can so. handle it. Yeah. Only two weeks. Totally hey, serious. Bro, you took a beginner and you put him on map split. The first work, oh first two God. workouts might fuck him up. Yeah, it, was, I, it, it might set him back. It might. Listen, yeah. I did. Uh, and you know what the irony of all yeah, this is? Yeah, but it's a six day a week. Bro, you want to know the irony of this? What? It's the most effective sales pitch of all time. And I know this because I'm getting messages from people right now. They're like, I know you said. That you have to be really experienced, but I bought it anyway because it looks really cool. Yeah. It's like the more you tell people not to do it, yes, the more they're going to do it. They, it is they like, rebel against us. He, like heed my warning, it is not for beginners. It well, is we an saw, advanced workout. We saw that with the hit Listen program. Listen to Dad. Uh, yeah. We sold more hit programs in in a single month than we have any other program since Mind Pump has started. And we all said like, this is not for everybody. This is not something you should do all the time. And then it sells more. Than it was else. it was pre predictable. But that's I, here's the thing. This is how I could. I can sleep at night and be okay with that is because the message that we've been saying since the very beginning is like, this is, you first should assess yourself. Yep. That's what Prime and Prime Pro is for. Like, first you need to like figure out like where the imbalance is. If you have joint pain, you mm -hmm. need to address all those things. That is the found, the true foundation from there, regardless of your pursuit, whether it be athletic performance, the way you look, mm -hmm. getting stronger, be, getting bigger, doesn't matter. And a bulk is the next true step from there. Then from there, there's, there is, I think, more options than like where you could go yeah. to me. Like I right. think from there, if you're more athletic pursuits, then I would definitely go performance. If you're more aesthetic pursuits, I would go black and then eventually split. Yeah. And yeah. even maps aesthetic has a shit ton of volume. So it's not like it's like start there. You want to no, start with that. It's not anabolic. a beginner program either. Yeah. And, and it's funny cause it's totally a litmus test for me because like I, with, with my wife, she's like, it's, I, I just know like what she'll subscribe to and what she won't. And like she saw that we put out a, a hit program finally, even then, and it was just like, oh yeah, awesome! And like she you made a like, program for me. Fights me every time because I'm like trying to get her into Prime and Prime Pro, and like really like like look, like we have a lot of issues we need to address before we do anything like that intensive. And uh, so, but yeah, it's just there. It's 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 human psychology, dude. I did so I've done a few of the workouts from Split, and they are. I mean, it's it's a decent amount of volume. It's a uh, with the way we organized it, it's really really well i got really sore got a crazy pump which here's the thing like if you like getting a pump there's nothing like focusing on three body parts in a workout versus doing the whole body right you're going to get a ridiculous pump right. when you do the workout so uh, but here's the other thing though i am getting a lot of we did get a few body quite a few bodybuilders who did maps aesthetic but bodybuilders, they like splits, especially experienced ones, right? They like to focus on more well, individual. And, and we have a lot of them now that are doing split. I've had quite a few DMs from people who are like, oh, perfect. I'm going to use this as my contest prep. Yeah. So I'm excited about that because I know what's going to happen. I know that these people are going to do this program. They're going to get the best shape that they've ever gotten to from a workout. 
and then they're going to be forever, you know, you know, mass well, consumers, which this, is cool. This one is is geared more towards the competitor versus somebody who's It's a, a bodybuilding program, who, 100%. It, besides someone who's trying to aspire to be competitor. So I look at aesthetic as like these are great steps like to if you're aspiring to be competitor or maybe mm-hmm. you're on one of your first few first few shows. What I'm seeing now is we're getting more pros that are using this program because mm-hmm. the amount of volume. Most people, if you've now reached your way to a national or a professional level, yeah. the amount of volume that you're doing of training is up there. So, I, what, How sense. much experience would you guys say? Because I was thinking about this the other day, and of course it depends on the individual, but if, you, if you've had a year of uninterrupted, consistent working out without injury or without it having to be all focused on rehab, so let's say you did a year of good, hard you know, consistent working out, you're probably okay with yeah with with doing map split. That's that's I think that's a pretty good general. Would, wouldn't you guys agree? Well, yeah, and you're you're somewhat pain free <laughs> as far as like you know your joints and are concerned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. muscle memory plays a part here too. So like if I had somebody who had been uh, cons- inconsistently oh, yeah, training for five, ten years of training, and then stop for a while. Then stop for a while. I think they could handle like aesthetic, and then that. So within three months, I think they yeah. could be right into mm-hmm. split. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're somebody who is a beginner but you've been consistently training for a year, I think you can go into yeah. split. So yeah. that's how I would recommend it. Definitely would not recommend it for somebody who is. This is my first program. Should I start here? No. Or I've been working out for three months or two months. And right. I just and, learned how to squat. Or right. I just learned how to overhead yes, press. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that you know and the only person that I would even say they could do it within a few months of training is if you're you've got a history of mm-hmm. lifting for a long time. You have a lot of. Muscle. I'll tell you what, man. I, what makes me really proud is when I look at the catalog of of programs that we've created and the mm-hmm. order that we've created them. Right. You can tell in, I'm not just, look, I'm not just blowing myself. Okay. Although I, I kind of am too, yeah, yeah, is I'm, uh, I'm, trust me, I can't, I've tried. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I got to remove some I'm, ribs. I'm looking at the whole catalog and we really did put it together like responsible, experienced personal trainers. We really did. Because if I took a client and I was in a client hired me and they put their trust in me and they said, Sal, Get me in the best shape possible in the best way possible because there's a fast way and then there's a best way yeah. where I'm really going to see great results. I'm going to feel good. It's going to be long term. I'm going to have a faster metabolism. I'm going to have great strength, great, all those different things. The order I would do it, the, the way I train them is the way we've kind of created our programs. Mm-hmm. And I'm very proud of that fact. Now, if we were all bodybuilders or we were all just people who like to work out or if we were all just fitness scientists without that experience of personal trainers, 100% the first fucking program we would have done would have been hit or split mm-hmm. those would have been the first two because that's what the market shows that yeah, people the want most popular yeah that's what people want they want high volume they want or they want super intense but the way we put it together is if i didn't know us and i look because i did this last night i was looking through our catalog and you know sometimes i like to i put myself in a state of mind where i really try hard and i know it's impossible but i really really try hard to look at things as if I was a, someone from the outside. Yeah. And you, this is actually a, an interesting practice and I recommend it to anybody. If you really want to uh, be objective about your life and examine things, pretend like you're looking at a friend of yours that you really care about. So that's what I did. I looked at this business and said, okay, let's imagine this is a business that's not mine. It's my friend's and, I'm, and he's asking me for my honest opinion. And so I looked at it and you can tell responsible, experienced personal trainers, yeah. you know, organized and put together these programs, which then got me to a whole nother train of thought, which, which is this. And it's fun. Did you guys read that article that uh, Jackie sent us? No, Did you no guys, I okay. didn't read it. Oh, fucking brilliant, dude. You guys got to read it. I don't know. It's a long article and I'm, she's going to put it in the show notes now that I'm talking about this. It's called The Ghost in the Machine. Is muscle, uh, muscle, muscle skeletal medicine lacking soul? And it's from Science Direct. So it's a great article. Hmm. And it talks about how, you know, and I'm going to paraphrase kind of what it talks about, but it's a brilliant, brilliant article. You know, Western medicine does such a good job of looking at objective, measurable factors that they forget that there's a whole nother subjective side to things when it comes to health and wellness and stuff like that. So an easy example, and I did a post of this this morning, an easy example example of this is pain. There's definitely objective things that can cause pain, but you, it's impossible to eliminate the subjective factor, how someone feels about it and how they perceive it. Right. Like literally what one person considers unbearable pain, another person might not even consider at all. Yeah. Or what mom, one person considers you know, terrible pain, someone else may actually seek out. 
Uh-huh. And so you can't separate the two. And I'm thinking about this as a personal trainer because, again, I was looking at our website and then I read this article. I'm thinking, you know, I could really break up my career as a personal trainer. And I know I've heard you guys echo the same thing into two main phases. Phase one was mastering the objective stuff, macros, proteins, fats, carbs, calories, uh, exercise technique, biomechanics, right. what gets your body Best to move better, like things I can yeah, measure. Recovery. Yeah, things I can measure, things that are objective and whatever. But about 10 years into my career, maybe eight to 10 years in my career, I'm looking at everything I'm like, you know, I'm not, I want to get better and I, I feel like I have a good mastery of a lot of the stuff or at least I have people I can work with that are, ma- that are masters in these things but I'm still not as good as I think I could be. And that's when I started to dive into the experience, the, the, the subjective, or, or is what Adam oftentimes will say, the psychological piece of it. You can't separate the two. Right. You really, really can't separate the two. And we're still dealing with that where mm-hmm. we'll release a program and we'll educate people, but they'll still go for the super intense thing because they don't have that other piece figured out. Yeah, you know, They just want, they want to hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they they connect pain with results or they connect pain with punishment because mm-hmm. they hate themselves. So, hey, I'm fat and I don't like myself. I'm going to go punish myself in the gym. Right. And that feels satisfying. Um, uh, and, and so they have that that part of it. They're not connecting the long term because everybody wants what's expedient. Um, and so we try to educate and try to bring that other side. But that other side is so so much more difficult, right? Yeah. I think I'm still in the middle of learning that piece. It's interesting too, and like, you know, looking at the catalog and everything, and I was actually having the same exact conversation with my wife about like, cause I'm like, yeah, split. And like, people are really into it. And, um, you know, a lot of people that have kind of skipped past some of the other foundational programs and went right to that. And like, what's, what, what's, you know, the deal with that. And it's just, I mean, it's human psychology, but you know, what I do feel good about is that we have a lot of answers. Like as far as like somebody that maybe like it's not, they're not in a place where that's appealing, you know, and and, uh, like who am I to like, you know, like pull them into like, well, you have to start with prime pro Mm -hmm. and we have to like master like the human body and like really understand like how every single like facet, you know, functions and how it's integrated and all this kind of stuff. Like a lot of people aren't interested in that, but guess what? Like there's going to come to a point where they're going to hit a wall and they're going to hit. And we have the answers. And we have the answers to then, you know, take you through that process and actually understand like how much of that is important, but you know, maybe you weren't ready at the time, but Mm -hmm. guess what? You're still going to get a badass workout and it's going to be a lot, uh, you know, more thought out. Like the, the, the whole programming of it is very much thought out. Well, dude, that's, trainers. that subjective side is so important. Like think about this, like all of us in this room had clients, a lot of clients that were with us for a very, very long time. And we, and a lot of them saw tremendous changes in their body, how they felt, maybe pain that they had forever finally went away. Now we can say objectively our training, the exercises, correctional exercise movement played a role in, in a lot of that stuff. But what, how much of the other stuff played a role? How much of the fact that they showed up twice a week and got to hang out with people that they enjoyed to be around? Yeah. Or they got to do something that gave them a sense of purpose or a sense of overcoming challenge? You know, I had my wellness facility. I just posted a video of Doug in our forum from four years ago when I used to train Doug. He's all ripped at this point because we were about to take photos uh, for, uh, I, th- we were, I think we were going to use him for MAPS Anabolic at the time. He got super shredded. And I'm watching the video and I'm remembering the environment that we had in that, in that studio. And it was such a great vibe. You know, a, a member would walk in and I would always, I don't care what I was doing. I could be in the back of the, of the gym. I'd yell across the gym their name. Like, what's up, Doug? Or what's up? And everybody had conversations together in there. People would tell me it feels like family. They bring their babies. They bring their kids. They bring their pets. Uh, it was just this great vibe. And I can't. I can't take that part out from the success that people had. That had to have played a role, right? Yeah. There's always that psychological piece that, you know, we try to address on the show, but God, how big of a role does that play? I mean, how big of a role do you guys really think that plays in, in somebody's success? it's huge. And again, I think that's why we wanted to be entertaining. Mm-hmm. You know, we wanted to, to be relatable, you know, because that's what we did mm-hmm. when we were trainers, you know, you, you really try to connect to the person and what their interests are and like just find a way to uh, convey information where it's like, okay, 
you're into similar interests or like, it, you know, this is an easy environment to, to really sit and absorb and it's, it's comfortable. It's nice. It's something I, I enjoy and I want to come back. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. these are all very important factors. Yeah. It's, a, it's, uh, I think it's a, well, people buy from people that they like, you know, that's a fact and people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care too. So I think both those <laughs> things are major factors in the whole entertaining first before you educate and you try and market and sell. And I think it's a big mistake. And it's really, it goes back to just where it's building value. You're building value by doing that. I get to be entertained by that. I get to hear that there is a a movement, a message behind all of this. And then on top of that, like, oh, they are going to provide something that's going to add value to my life. Like Mm -hmm. that's a no brainer to me. I had a conversation a couple of days ago with a friend of mine, this this young lady who um, she's very fit. Uh, she's attractive. She's, you know, charismatic, all those other things. But she also has, sometimes she'll have these bouts of really, really poor self-image. And we were having a conversation about this. And she's like, I'm, I'm not, she's like, I, I don't like my face right now. I don't feel like I, I and she's an attractive, if I showed you guys a picture of her, you'd be like, for sure, objectively, she's an attractive young lady, but she doesn't believe she is. And she's talking about how she wants to get Botox and do these other things. And I'm like, you know, you could do everything in the world to try to remedy what you're feeling and you'll never be satisfied. And we have so much evidence of this, right? Mm -hmm. We have so much evidence of people going down that path of getting procedure after procedure after procedure or people who get shape, get ripped, still hate themselves. I mean, you know, I used to get shredded and I do things to my body that were horrible and I felt worse about myself then than I did, than I do now. And I didn't look like I did, you know, I don't look like I did back then. And it's like, I was trying to convey that, that aspect, like that whole, like, that whole subjective side to it. Like that's such a big part of your success in when it comes to wellness and pretty much everything else. Fuck. We have, we have studies right now. You can look them up where people will go in, they have knee pain. They'll go in, the doctor will open them up and sew them back up. Won't even do a surgery on their knee. And the success rate of that is the same as it was if they actually did the procedure. So crazy. You know what I'm so saying? So powerful. The mind, you know, like we just, uh, it, every time, like it, it, it always just blows me away. Like what we're capable of. You yeah. Know, if we just believe. It's not just, I mean, it's believing, but it's also the, the kind of the root. I mean, you know, I, I've how many times have I said like, you know, exercise and eat because you love yourself, not because you hate yourself. Right. You know, people say all the time, I know if I get fit, I know if I lose weight, I'll, I'll be happy. And it's, it's the reverse. I hate to tell you. Yeah. In order for you to, tr- to, to lose weight forever, you have to kind of learn that happiness part yeah. first. Be happy. Respect yourself. You don't get it the other way around. You know what I wanted to, I wanted to share something before I forgot because we just added more resources to the, the free resource page. And a lot of people don't know that we have this. You know, one of the things I, I love that we did too, talking, tooting our horn more, is <laughs> right. We'll just keep, I'm just going to jump great. on that, keep going, yeah, right? A bunch of hands. Yeah, 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 right. No, is this the amount? I mean, there's so much free content that we provide on a daily basis that you can't possibly consume all of it. And because of that, it also may be difficult for some people to find all of that. And I highly encourage people to utilize all that before ever investing in anything that we have to offer that would actually cost you any money. Oh, we have a bunch of free guides. Right. So if you go on the the Mind Pump Media website and then the first, if you hit the drop down and you look underneath programs, there's a free, a free. Even easier than that now, Doug has a link. It's just Mind Pump Free. Dot com. Mm. Does mindpumpfree.com even have the new free resources that have been put up already? Oh, oh awesome. it does. Yeah. Yeah. So it's mindpumpfree.com. So you just go to mindpumpfree.com and then you can have access to oh, What are the different resources? Are you, do you yeah. have them up yeah, there Yeah, no, there's, there's what is there? flabby arms, there's a flat tummy, there's great calves, there's uh, hit workouts, there's a uh, great butt, there's uh, developing your legs, how to build a chest, how to lose fat in three steps. So, and these are all, these are, so most people in our space take these types of things and they sell them for 27 to 29 dollars some yeah those. they're at, they're legit guides yeah they're legit i mean there's i mean most of them these are 5000 word documents mm-hmm. that you you've put together and some of them even have imagery and stuff on that and it's completely free so I highly recommend. We're going to keep doing this too. We're going right, to keep adding to this. We are trying to build this out. Yep, I mean, got plans I mean, for this. Yeah, the, the strategy here for us is, uh, and it's I mean, it's going to sound bad, but I mean, uh, most of uh, the fitness people that are, are we consider would consider a competitor. 
that charges for all these types of resources, we want to be able to provide it uh, for free for people. You know, a lot of companies do a paid wall. So it costs $9.99 a month to you guys get access and they release things like this for you to read, which are of great value and is probably worth $9, but we're providing it for free people. And, and we're adding, we just added two more to this free resource page and we'll continue to add more as we, we continue to get more organized about it. So that's one thing that a lot of people don't even know that we have. Obviously, the the YouTube channel, Mind Pump TV, is dropping anywhere between three to five videos every week. And we slowed down the cadence on that because we wanted to add more value. We found ourselves committing to one every single day and we were going like, okay, we were just trying to put out the content. It's like, you know what, why don't we scale it back a little bit and make sure the videos that we are putting out there are of more value to the consumer. So you know, we're not quite moving at the cadence that we were when we first started, but I would argue that the the stuff and the content that we're putting out is even more valuable. So if you're Agreed. not subscribed to the Mind Pump TV, that's another free resource. Then in addition to that, like we have got a, a blog area on the website where almost every day, I think about every other day, we have bloggers that are blogging articles and Sal oversees this. So these are all specific people that he f- saw what they were writing about, saw the value in them and the message they were giving. And so we provide these blogs. Yeah, like one of the more recent ones is weighing the pros and cons of a ketogenic diet, for example. Right. So they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty good articles and we vet them. So... So we get great the, resource. We got the blogs that are that are going out. We even have uh, thirty days of coaching for free on on Mind Pump. So we what we did was we thought, okay, if somebody drops in, if so, if you're listening to this podcast right now, it's the first time you've ever heard about Mind Pump, and you're like, okay, well, you know, these guys got eight hundred episodes. What should I listen to, or what what are they mess their message all about? Well, what we did was we curated. Uh, what we thought were thirty uh, or twenty eight or so of the the most important topics that we could provide. If I only had twenty eight days to give somebody bits of information, how would I do that? And so every day is a new topic. For example, like protein is like day one, and there's some bullet points on the thing, the the do's, the don'ts, the myths behind protein, and then there's links to articles, there's links to studies to support the things that we talk about on the show, yeah. and then there's links to episodes where we actually talk in more depth to those specific topics. Absolutely free for you guys. Yeah, mm-hmm. and not to mention our 30-day you know, training. No, the one that we did in January on oh, YouTube. Oh, on YouTube. That's right. right. That's completely that's free, a, but we actually programmed it so just you know, any beginner or somebody that's you know deconditioned or hasn't been training for a while can at least go through a program that's like legitimately mm-hmm. programmed. We did the first five days of the mass program. So if you're somebody who's like, oh, this is an expensive program. I don't know if I want to invest it yet. I don't want to test drive it. You can go to the Mind Pump TV uh, YouTube and actually test drive what the first five days uh, of a program was like. So, yeah. you know, th- that's how confident I think what we were when we were doing this of, uh, as far as providing the value is like, listen. We're, we try to give, we're, we're, I mean, the goal is to give as much free stuff as possible. Yeah. More and more and more free, free, free. Just so people get that that free value. I, I mean, there is an underlying purpose behind what we're doing. It's just to it's to spread the right type of information and you know kind of change the way the industry does things. And so there you go. Take yep. that, dude. I got a I got a, a study I want to share. I forgot to bring this up. I've had it now for a couple days. I'm gonna read the title of the study: Overeating during breastfeeding. Okay, may affect the health of offspring. A mouse study suggested. Now here's what happened. They had mice. They overfed them while they were breast while they were feeding their pups. The pups were more likely to be obese and went through early puberty. And this kind of mirrors other correlative studies that show that women, when they're breastfeeding, if they eat overeat, the more their children are more likely to be obese and more likely to go through early puberty. Now that's crazy that you say that because, and I don't think I've ever said this on this podcast because it's controversial, is. I remember going back to my hometown where I grew up in high school and seeing the high school girls in after about, I don't know, let's say five to 10 years that I was, you know, out of high school. And I remember telling my buddies like, dude, is it me or do they just look way more developed and way more like women already at this young of an age than they did while we were going mm. to school. Oh, oh, kids are going through puberty earlier. Yeah, I've, I've it's just, just it's we were speculating on that, and I'm like, okay, that's not something that I can really talk about without having any proof behind sure, sure. that. But that that seems to lead in that direction. That, no, it's a it's a real statistic, and and they oh, part it, part of it is is that the only only one, or is there other studies? No, that, no, this is a study to show that this is an animal model, of course, but to show that during breastfeeding, if they eat more 
or they overeat, their their offspring are more likely to be obese and go through early puberty. Now, early puberty has already been, we've observed this happening in, in modern societies now for a little while. Part of it is the obesity. Like if you, if a girl, especially for girls, if you have, if a, if a young girl overeats and is obese as a child, the odds that she'll go through puberty earlier are much higher because that presence of extra calories tells the body it's safe to be able to conceive. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't account for how much earlier. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't that long ago that the average age of puberty for girls was like 17, I think. If, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, maybe you can look that up, Doug. Wow, really? Yeah, and now it's like, it's, it's gone down quite a bit. Now, of course, back then there was more malnourishment. People didn't have as much food. Right. So that'll delay puberty. But a lot of scientists are thinking that A, it has to do with the excess food and B, it might have to do with the hormones and chemicals and stuff that act on the estrogenic or hormone system of, uh, of, of kids. Well, I would think that how, how much of the food that we consume now or the average American consumes now that is pumped full of the is pumped full of hormones, like why would we think that we would not absorb some of that? that yeah. Right. Like maybe in a, in a basic, you know, six month trial of just consuming meat that had, you know, the cows were getting pumped with growth hormone for the the, the longevity mm-hmm. of their their life and maybe that doesn't show like any major major changes but if a lot of the foods that you're consuming is pumped full of these hormones and for you these, do it for a long time and you do it for a long or time. the mom does it right mom the does, it, does it now that yeah right it's like why would we not think that would mm-hmm. not change some of the chemistry up in our in i, our, I our read own. another study not that long ago where they were connecting what the what the man eats in his sperm and how that can contribute to a, a child that might be more obese because mm. there's all these now epigenetics that we're starting to learn where wow. you yes you're born with certain genes but how wh- your life influences how they express themselves mm-hmm. and then that though that ex- that changes how your children's genes express themselves so all this happening before even the sperm meets the egg yeah dude there crazy. i can't remember what what article i read about this was an animal study where if the mother was uh, under lots of stress or whatever uh, before conception, uh, before conception, and then uh, you know obviously during conception, that even though the the baby was born in a stress, uh, not a stressful uh, environment, they would have these reactions and like they were in a stressful environment, like their body adapted, which makes sense. You're, you're, I mean, if you think about it, evolutionarily speaking. The, you know, the, the, the baby's being born into this environment that its mother was living in. So it makes sense that genes would express themselves differently to prepare for this type of environment. So it's like if, you're, if your mom and dad were super hyper stressed, mm-hmm. you're more likely to, to, be, to be that way. And it's not, the, it's not because their genes were created that way, but because they express themselves through their own experiences and behaviors. Mm-hmm. So it's just something to think about, you know, if you're if you're having a child. I know and it sounds like so much pressure, right? I on know. people. Yeah, it's just like don't a lot fuck more up. factors. Yeah. Well, yeah, going don't into think it. about bad things. Katrina and I Katrina and I have talked about this before and like we both we're on the same page that we agree regardless of uh how much we believe some of this stuff to be true or just correlation and not really causation. Like, I don't care. Like if there was ever a time that I was going to discipline myself or I wanted us as a family to discipline ourselves to make the best food choices and the best choices to keep you out of a very high stressful environment, like nine months to me is nothing. I mean, being somebody who comes from competing and knowing the dedication and sacrifice that it took to move to the level that I did in that, for me, I look at it as like, I don't give a fuck if I got to like carry her, cook all the meals, do everything. I'll like for nine months to try and make sure that I'm putting her in the best situation possible. And, and as, and I, and I know it's inevitable that things are going to happen and it'll never be perfect, but I think a lot of people just don't even think about that. Like mm-hmm. it's not even a conversation. It's just like, whatever we'll eat, whatever, whatever we'll do, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter or I'm craving this. So it's more about keeping my wife happy because she's craving something versus like, is this probably the best thing that we should be consuming for the baby right now? Like, I don't know. I think that I'm, I'm glad that where her head is with something like that, because I know that would be something that's important. To well, me. you know, it wasn't that long ago that uh, women would, would drink and smoke while they were pregnant and it wasn't that big of a deal. And now socially, if you did that, 
Oh, yeah. you, like, could you imagine seeing a, if you saw like a lady like it's sitting in a chair with a you know, big old pregnant belly and oh, she was dude. like smoking? Oh yeah, people <laughs> would lose their mind. Oh, yeah, I wasn't I, even thinking of it. Like Courtney was at the grocery store; she was pregnant at the time, and I was like, "Can you pick up, you know, some whiskey, you know, for me or whatever?" And, like <laughs> she was so mad at me. She got home. She's like, "I got so judged, you know, <laughs> while I was there." It's like it's not for me, yeah. you know. Like, I was like, oh, I'm, but, "I'm not gonna make you." Do I wonder that again. if in Sorry. the fu- I wonder if in the future with more of this information that's coming out if it'll be like that when if a pregnant woman's eating like a cake or you know doing things that i are, think so maybe huh? i think it's not just a pregnant woman i think that what we will eventually, oh, everybody unle- unless what we speculated before that science evolves fast enough to where it's not gonna matter. nanobots and things like that aren't going to matter because they'll find a way or a pill or something to cancel out all the bullshit that you're consuming if we keep going the way we're going with autoimmune and all the issues that we see arising and it getting worse and worse then I do think that that will be that will be the pendulum coming the other way is people, socially unacceptable. Yeah, people or, will start to kind of look at each other and go like, "Oh, you're really yeah. going to eat that?" Like, wow. Or, or and we'll know we'll see it in the market ahead of time because you'll see these big fast food companies and the people that are high, these highly processed foods. You'll see them start to to dip and. I don't follow. They're already starting. Uh, a lot of fast food companies are are losing money. Soda consumption has started to drop. I've definitely for the seen first that. time. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. What's, Do you know this that, is the beginning. I would like Doug to Google that. I would, I'd be interested to see like the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the the big players out there. Like fast you know, food consumption. Yeah, is yeah. fast food consumption on the rise, on the decline, and, and yeah. are they making more money or not? Like it'd be really interesting to I'm, see. I'm pretty sure it's I've been heard soda. I don't know about fast food. Yeah, they feel like they're really resilient. Yeah, you know, so do I. That's why when Sal said that, facts. I want him to Google because yeah. I don't, I don't know that. I haven't heard that at all. Mm. Now I do. I have, a, I have a friend slash old client of mine who owns like, you know, ten McDonald's, and I talk to her a lot about you know, the challenges that they have and all the different pivots and things like that. And I do know that they're not, you know, it's, she's struggling. She's been somebody who it's been in their family. Her dad had them first. Now she's got them. And, you know, she's like, it's harder than ever. I mean, she thinks about leaving it all the time because wow, of how, how wow. challenging it is. Oh, here, well, yeah, no, I've, I've pulled up a few articles that says that uh, food, fast food consumption is on the decline. One, one here, so this was in 2014, I want to see that one that Doug's looking at right now. Mm. It blown up. I can't read quite exactly what it's saying right there. It's, it's a bunch of graphs. Yeah, but I can't see if it's is it is it saying is it confirming what we're saying, Doug, or is it just what is it? I don't think so. It's not confirming. No, I so need to Sal's, find a better article. Sal's wrong again. I'm keeping track nowadays. Yeah. Well, oh, I mean, wow. I have an article right here from the New York Times that says Americans are finally eating less. Another one says fast food is witnessing a fast decline. It's it's I, and if if. It feels this way also, but I did read an article. Yeah, but I don't like that. I don't like that as a, because I I feel uh, many times I I feel like like I'm always speculation. Well, many times I think a a lot of the stuff that we speak to is because we're in our own bubble and we like, oh man, it's crazy. Everybody is doing this now. It's like, well, that's because everybody we talk to have a lot of things in common with we do. How often do we hang out and talk to people that have nothing to do with health? What about the entire marketplace? Right. Yeah. I don't know what that looks like. Is there still middle America? Yeah. They're they're putting it down. Oh, look. Look at this fast food sales are growing faster than u.s economy. well hold on when was that when was that uh published 2017 2017 growing faster than the u.s economy and that's doesn't... august of 2017 that's not that old yeah but it doesn't say if it's if it's trending in a different that's... like slower or well, faster than what's what it the was? source how's that, you know like well, how's I... that not how's that not trending we'll read it it says in the first time in the first quarter, oh the wow big three fast food so chains. the articles out so trip off this you know what's funny so the articles that i was reading were 2015 because it was a study that showed that Fast food consumption has declined, but looks like it. See how it says the burger is back for the first time in five quarters. See, I told you it had gone down, but now it's going back up. That's hilarious. Did you just try and make yourself sound right when you were wrong right there? No, that's what it says right there. <laughs> dude, you're just like arguing with Katrina. But the, Seriously. The, the first time. Is, is a politician. Is the, dude. She's the you same way, that. dude. She's Read like, that paragraph, she's the first like, paragraph. I don't, I don't need know. to, bro. You're He's wrong. He's the king of spin. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Right? It's like, well, technically, I'm right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, because I said I read the Like, yeah, okay. No, yeah. you're wrong, actually. It's, it's on the yeah. rise. Well, the, the first paragraph says for <laughs> the, the first time read was, in five quarters. Yeah, he's right So there you go. So, yeah. So it's it's been on the rise for well over a year now. So it's, uh, yeah, dude, I, scary. That's, see, that's scary to me. Yeah. I mean, the, these are the biggest players and movers in that in that space. 
and you know we're over here thinking that our message is getting through. I don't know, bro. Well, I, you know what? I, yeah. I tell you, I've I, seen Burger King making big moves. I tell lately, you what, especially with like podcasts. Here, Doug, why don't you post the, the the article I just sent you right now, so you can so Adam can shut his face. <laughs> <laughs> he had you know what it is justin he has yeah. to jump on that i know so rare. I, bro I it's know usually this. him in the seat I, don't fucking get his back on <laughs> this I don't get this. his fucking no back. i love this oh, I, I love the uh the the debacle you guys i just you know what speaking of you being wrong you were wrong about something else oh you forgot yeah to the, apologize oh, for. yeah i have to apologize about this so oh yes, what does that yes. say real quick <laughs> i'm gonna kick him while he's down hold on, yes, a, second. You are. Hold on a second what does that say up right there uh, worst uh, chain restaurant slumps since 2009. Six quarters in a row, year over year declines. Wow, look restaurant. At that. So what does that mean? six quarters in a row. Before that, it was on an increase, and that's two. Th and that that article came before the other article. This one's so, 2017. Right, but right before the other one. Wow. When was the other one? August. August. Yeah. Oh, so it was a month before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're still wrong. It's weird. Like it's <laughs> no, so check market. So place. check this out. I do want to apologize. I said I, I don't remember saying this, but I know I think I did. And uh, you made we a you made a Norton, comment about Australia not, not being really, in the World War, not really being. They involved. were very much integral parts of world war one and they world were war two they were a small amount of people is that what it was they were actually a decent amount compared to the population of australia so i do want to apologize to my australian listeners they you guys us. did play a yeah, big role come on man we love yeah. australia yeah. but i was accurate with their, their love for the word cunt they do yeah. have a massive <laughs> <laughs> they actually they actually said that in the post he's like you're right about that that's one uh, of our favorite words okay. to use all right so, so you did have one thing yeah i was right about all that right. one this quaz brought to you by organifi for those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. All right, our first question is from N8 Morris. How do you know when it's time to change up your routine and continue progressing adaptation? Oh, good question. Yeah, it is. I, I, a lot of people wait until their body stops progressing yeah. and they plateau. Mm. Here's why I think that's a mistake. By the time you've hit a plateau, now you have to, you almost have to work take a few steps back almost. and work your way out of it. Yeah. Which Now you say which can, that, you say that, but I also think that it's okay to go through that a few times to be certain that that's what it takes for you because mm. i remember when we were this was actually kind of this like open you know healthy debate that we had when we were creating the programs of do we make the phases three weeks four longer weeks six weeks yeah. yeah longer or shorter because in all of our experience you know i've had clients that continue to see great results all the way up to five six weeks sure. into uh, running yeah, a type sure, of a sure, phase sure. right and then i've also had others that you know after two weeks of doing something they really start to slow down there their will problem. always be those individual variances right with that. and yeah and i think yeah you're on to something with that but at the same time like if you go through that we, you don't want to like uh duplicate the the same mistakes right you don't want to you don't want to like uh, repeat that so we're trying to kind of stay ahead of it by prescribing it you know within that range of like three to four weeks based off of what we've seen our clients. And that's a through. general prescription yeah. because it's, it can be very different. It from is because I can individualize it though. Personally, I tend to stretch almost every phase we do one more week than what we recommend. Mm -hmm. That's just the straight up truth. Like is even though this is the program we wrote, we recommend. And I think, I think the way we recommend it is very responsible mm -hmm. that it's like most everybody will probably we have just, to write it that way. Right. This everybody. is a sweet spot, but we also talk that there is an individual variance that somebody may continue to see as because honestly, right at like week three, I'm seeing my best results, and like week four, it still carries into there for me on a lot of our programs. So I tend to stretch it one more week, and I think that people should have that flexibility to do that even within our own programs. But I also think too that sometimes you have to go through that hard plateau to kind of to real. At least for me, I had to I had to slam my dick in the door a few times before I realized like. But how do you how do you here's the but the question is how Ouch. do you know before that happens? You know what I'm saying? Like you can wait until you plateau. You got to measure it exactly. Yeah. So what my what I'm saying uh, is know is the following a, following a phase. And here's the things I'm looking for. Here's your indicators. Your indicators are 
the the slowing down uh, or the lack thereof of progress mm-hmm. or two uh, nagging achy pain in joints mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. those two those two to me are yeah, big they speak to you they do those are two big facts I, if i'm seeing results sometimes i'm seeing results still but then i my joints are speaking to me and telling me like hey you've been doing these these heavy lifts for too long it's time to phase out of that or again using the progress thing i was seeing great progress for the first two weeks now i'm not seeing hardly any or none at all yeah you're feeling more fatigued going into your workout so i I almost feel like that's too late like once you get to the point where it starts to hurt or in a bad way or yeah but how do you know that until you do that that well how do you know the stove is hot so you touch it and get burned here's how i so here's what i started to do is when i would have the best progress in the phase where like oh my god i hit a new pr or, oh my God, this is the best workout. I can see all these great results. Then I would transition. That's when I would transition, when my body was hitting its peak. Which nobody, including yourself, does or did for a very long time. Oh, yeah. It's hard. That's why I'm but saying. But if, 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 if the question is asking I don't, me I don't know. I don't advice, know. I, would say, I would say do that. Like If you hit a new PR, yeah. transition. Transition you, right after that. Right after. I, I, you know, for me, it's like just become aware of that. Like Be aware that you're going to, when you start seeing the most results, it's going to be the most tempting to keep going and to keep pushing. So hard, right? And so yeah. you have to be truly objective with yourself and go, Okay, or subjective with it and go, oh my God. Objective. Uh, objective. I said it right the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, objective with yourself and go, oh, okay, am I, am I, is my body starting to talk to me? Am I seeing as many results as I was, as much results as I was seeing a week ago? And if the answer is yes, you, you feel great still, you're seeing even more results the next week, then maybe it's okay to continue to go a little bit. Or if you're being completely honest with yourself, you go, oh, you know, I didn't, I, I tried it. I hit my PR. I tried to stretch it again. I ended up doing five, 10 pounds less. There's my flag that I shouldn't have stretched myself. Again. I mean, it's impossible to know for sure, but in my experience, for example, if you hit a PR this week, it's very rare to hit a PR the following week again. Mm-hmm. So if I hit a five or 10 pound or 15 pound PR this week. Now I have, it's, and it's, I, it's, I, I experienced that when we were, when you and I were in the, the kind of deadlift thing and we were going back and forth, there was week over week where I was hitting PRs. It was really exciting. Now, yeah. that also got me in trouble right? because I hit a PR, then I hit another PR. But it's not super common, right? It's not super common to hit PRs like one out, unless it, you're a beginner. Yes. Or, I mean, I think well, somebody I think somebody who's hitting- Definitely I've, beginners. Yes. I've, I've had many people who I've turned maps onto and they start following the program and it is programmed so goddamn well that they're getting stronger week over week. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's why we structured it that way to to make sure that like, you know, because there is that excitement. Force you to come out of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's like you have to trust, and we say trust the process and it's mainly just because you want to keep doing it. You want to keep like experiencing that high of like getting to a new benchmark. Like, right. oh my God, look what I did. Like, let me see what if I can keep going. Right. And But we're trying to put cautionary out there because, you know, I've been down that road and I've actually gone a few more times Maybe I have hit another PR. Maybe a third time I hit a PR. That one, oh my God, just destroyed my shoulder. Right. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's why yeah. I think it's like the safe way. And I don't think it'll hurt either to when you hit a new level of performance, switch into a new phase or style of training. I agree. When I've done it in this way in the past and in, in, in now, when I do it this way now, and I have to be, it's, it's always hard. Even now it's hard because you have a great workout, new performance, you know, measures have been hit. You want to fucking go for it again the next time. You want to keep exceeding because you're on. You got this momentum. But when I switch out of it immediately, it's like perpetual progress. Now I'm in the higher rep range. It, the first few workouts are hard. The first week is kind of getting used to the new rep range, and then boom, I'm doing it again. Well, there's the other thing, right? So when you're switching it, you're typically if you're going to switch your adaptation focus, that first week of going into something completely new, you suck at it again. Yep, yep. And that's mentally exhaustive. Yeah, yep. That's tough. Yeah. And so people are like discouraged by that. Uh, the way I look at it is is there's a, a potential for progress, and what I mean by that is if I'm always training heavy, let's say I'm always training the low rep range. And let's say my deadlift is at 500 pounds and, and I'm, I'm trying to inch it up higher and higher each time I work out. And uh, I do a really good job. At, let's, say I, you know, I'm, I'm, let's say I weigh 180 pounds, a 500 pound deadlift for 180 pound guys, really, really good. And let's say I, you know, if I train real hard, I might be able to get another 10 pounds on my deadlift in a two or three month training cycle, 10, 15 pounds. That'd be a big gain in that period of time for that, that kind of weight. Now on the flip side, if I try a new exercise that I'm not good at or not used to, 
let's say I've never done a Bulgarian split squat. So the first time I do it, I'm holding 25 pound dumbbells. My potential for progress on that's fucking massive. And what you'll find that as you learn and get better at the movement, you'll progress way more to where it's not a 10 or 15 pound gain. It's a 50 to 80 pound gain, mm-hmm. right. which is why you were progressing so quickly, Adam, with the deadlift at right. that point, because you hadn't really never pushed yeah, yourself with the deadlift skill. That, and that's what I mean by that is like, so we're talking to a lot of people that going into maps, this, it could be so different. And you, I think the, the, the best advice, especially if you're following the programs and we it was said this since day one is follow the whole program to a T the first time, like to a T like phase out, do everything that we say inside there. Then from there, we encourage people to modify and stretch limits and maybe pull back on this or change this out and to, and to play with these things so you then can start to really learn your body and how unique it is in comparison to, to you know the people that are programming it for you. So I think that if you don't do that, then it's you're constantly speculating and you have no real basis to go off of that, oh, when I followed it like I was supposed to, this is how I felt. Now that I start stretching the phases one more week longer or shortening them up or mm-hmm. eliminating an exercise and replacing, now I can compare like, oh, when I was doing that before, this is how I progressed in comparison to this time. I think that's the important takeaway. Yeah. And this. for most people, that's two to five weeks, I would say, is probably the range, right? Would you say to switch yeah. out of a, a yeah. form of adaptation be about two to five weeks? A safe number is three weeks, I would say, for most people. Um, so, you know, if you're in a training phase around three weeks, if you don't know your body yet, it's probably yeah. a good time to switch. Next question is from Louis Neri. How would you guys deal with constant self-hate? I find myself putting myself down after any mistake I make, big or small. Hmm. Yeah, I think... I used to go through this a bit. Did you? Yeah, I used to go through this a bit. And I think that, um, I mean, this came with wisdom later as, as far as... Uh, somebody had told me, like actually pointed out the way that I talked about myself. And then it was like this eye opening thing. Like if I'm always, you know, hammering myself so much and like being self-critical uh, and I'm using this language, that negativity is going to come back and it's going to, you know, form about how I, how I view myself. And, you know, that, that's sort of like a, this, this spiral that, that it creates. And um, I think that, at some point, it was like, yes, I can be, I can be critical of what I'm doing, and I can know where my weaknesses lie. But you know, as far as you know, the 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 talk about myself and you know, like moving forward, like I really just focused on like having shedding a better light on myself, and and you know, like yeah, I might not be good at this, but guess what, I can be good at this. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like changing changing the language, changing changing the verbiage. Uh, a little bit to, to, to shift now my mentality towards things. And so, you know, once I realized that like, okay, I can address, you know, really, really the weaknesses that I, I know inherently I have and I immerse myself in them and I see that like every time I work at it, I get better. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. all it is. It's just about working at it and getting better. Well, let's break down what a mistake is. What is a mistake? Mistake. All a mistake really is, is you thought this was a good idea to do. You applied yourself and you did it, and then you were wrong. It wasn't a good idea. It was a mistake, right? Isn't that what a mistake is? Sure. Yeah. And almost anything you look at. So if you just reframe what this mistake really is, mistake is, is a learning process for you to find the right answer. And li- many times in our life, we don't have the right answer and we make mistakes. Well, what's great about that is now I know. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that before. I was pondering it. I thought this was the right thing for me to do. I went and did it. I was fucking wrong. Now, instead of hating myself for that, what an idiot. I can't believe I did that. I'm so stupid. Like mm-hmm. It's like, awesome. That's not the way to do that. Yeah. I know for sure because guess what? I applied myself. I did it. I was wrong. Now I know. Mm-hmm. Like, And so if you look at that, and that's all leveling up. That's all growing. That's Mm -hmm. all getting better. That's all getting smarter. That's all building. Like, so if you just learn to reframe, you know, the mistake part and not think of it as like, oh, I'm such an idiot, stupid me. It's like, no, you know what's awesome is that you put yourself out there to make a mistake. Most motherfuckers are too scared to even take that step. The fact that you took a step, you made a mistake, you know that that was not, now you know that's not the right answer, now you can then reapply yourself and hopefully make the right answer. And so I think you just got to reframe it differently instead of looking at it as a, a mistake as such a bad thing. I think it's, right. it's it becomes hard when people make the same mistake 
over and over again. That's when the judgment really sets in. Like, why do I keep doing this thing over and over again? Why do I keep putting myself in this position? Ooh, that's a different. Now, that's a different answer. And now, to that. and here's the thing: self hate comes from a, 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 a natural feeling that's supposed to motivate you, or inspire you, or whatever word you want to use to not make that mistake again, or not we do that behavior again. We talked about this again. with athletes too, and that's why you know I think that's why it was drilled in my head for so long that like these mistakes you know, I own those mistakes. Mm-hmm. And like, and then I would, I would like hammer myself like every single game if I made one little mistake and like that mentality, it just did not benefit me after a while. No, it, hating we, yourself doesn't have a whole lot of value. I mean, if, at some, there's a small part of value where, okay, it can motivate you. You can look at what you did and say, okay, that was dumb. That was wrong. I'm not going to do that again. So there's that, but actively hating yourself beyond that that isn't benefiting you at all. And I know why it's easy. I understand why it's easy to do. I mean, you know more about yourself than anybody else in the world. So you know just how imperfect you are. You know just how lazy you can be. You know just how bad decisions you make even though you knew that you should have made a different decision. So it's very easy to judge yourself. It's very easy to not to lack empathy for yourself because only you know the full extent of your potential and the full extent of the, you know, the, the, the behaviors you can make. You know, having children really helped me with this a lot because I can look at my kids and my kids make mistakes all the time. They fuck up all, they're human. Everybody fucks up. By the way, this is not a person, this is not a you problem. This is an existential human problem. So just remember that you're not alone in the world. You're not the only one fucking up. This is what everybody does. So just remember that first and foremost. But when my kids make mistakes or fuck up, I don't hate them. Sure, there's times when I dislike them. That's that's true. There's definitely times where I'm like, okay, you're you're being a little shit or whatever. But I don't hate them. And and having children help me realize like, well, if I can if I can be like that for them, why can't I be like that for me? I'm in me. Mm-hmm. I am me. Like mm-hmm. like I have no choice. I can't get out of myself or whatever, right? So wh- why can't I do that for myself? Why can't I have the empathy and care for me? And that was a was a huge realization. I really well, if you're going to take the empathy route in that way, and and you know, I I get that. But then I'm gonna I'm gonna give different advice with somebody who is making the same mistake over and over, and I'm not gonna let you off the hook as much because if you're making the same mistake over and over, and then the self hate thing may be an easy out for you. Mm. It may be an easy way for you to just feel sorry for yourself. And I see that a lot with people that make the same mistakes over mm-hmm. and over. Making the same mistake over and over and making a mistake are two different things to me. Yeah. If you are if you have a pattern and you keep doing the same shit and you keep getting yourself in the same boat, then you need to dive deeper into yourself and ask yourself why. Yeah. And why? That's, that's a good point because hating yourself may actually make you feel like it's okay to make that yes, mistake right. over and over yeah, again. Yeah, feeling sorry for yourself. Like That's you victim yourself, role type shit to yeah, me. Yeah, you yeah. gave yeah. yourself punishment. Right. Yeah. Okay, I hated myself. I've got, a, I got empathy. I got tons of empathy for people that make mistakes trying and risking things that they're uncertain of and that's how they find the answer out. That's one thing. That I do not have a lot of patience and empathy for somebody who continues to make the same mistakes over and over. That is you. It makes no attempt at it. Exactly. That is you not having good self-awareness and self-reflection on why. Mm -hmm. Why the fuck do I keep doing this? And instead of feeling sorry for yourself and having self-hate about it is diving deeper into the root cause of why you keep going down this pattern, which is probably rooted in some sort of an insecurity or bad pattern that you've created in your life. And that needs to be addressed. Bottom line, and I'm not letting you off the hook with the empathy thing if you're doing it over and over. So that's how I'm talking to somebody who makes repetitive mistake, the same mistake over and over, and somebody who makes a mistake, two different things. Next question is from Rachel D. What is more marketable as a trainer, having years of experience or multiple certifications? I have been training for five years and I have gained lots of knowledge from coworkers and just self-study. But would I be more marketable if I had certifications to add to my name? Well, do you know even know the certifications that we all hold? Mm. I've never, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got a fuck ton. Well, I had a fuck ton of them. I don't. None of them are, are valid anymore. But I you, probably had the least certs out of the, out of the three of us. Right, the smartest guy in the room has the least amount of education. Mm. Uh, so I, you yeah. know, I think from a marketing standpoint, there's a few markets within personal training where certifications may help, like correctional exercise, rehab, that kind of stuff. Other than that, yeah, but even then, you could. I, I mean, getting hired. Think about what your girl's doing right now by shadowing it. Dr. Brink for six oh, yeah. months. I mean, yeah. there's way more value in that than going out and getting a certification. In real, yes, absolutely. Right. So I still think 
here's the only way I, here's where I see the most value in certifications is if you're going to work for a facility mm-hmm. where you're going to be compared to 15, 20 other trainers. So you work for a 24 hour fitness, a golds of LA fitness or whatever your big chain is that's near you. And that one also separates you from your peers that are at the, because technically you're somewhat competitive because the pool of leads are the people that are inside the gym. You having more certifications and experience separates you from your peers. But if you're somebody who is out on your own and marketing yourself to the the rest of the world, I've yet to ever have anybody who considered hiring me and said, what certifications do you have? How many certs do you have? Yeah. Never, 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 never. And me saying, I think I've been doing this for 15 years has a lot more clout than actually, oh, rattling off all these acronyms that the that 99% of the population have no fucking idea what ACSM is, NASM is, Nesta is, NCSF is, ACE is. Like, nobody knows what the fuck that is. What does that mean to them? No. It means nothing to them. But you being able to answer their questions with, uh, oh, yeah, you know what? I actually have trained quite a few clients who have struggled with that same thing, and here's what I've done to help them. That's a lot of power. Well, there's that, and I mean, you mentioned self-study. It's definitely, that's... I mean, educating yourself and getting more education and applying that and then applying those concepts, like that is a crucial part of sure. it. Like to to be able to keep yourself receptive to new information. Like you don't want to be that trainer doing the same old shit that we talk shit about. Right. You know, and, and not changing your ways and being receptive. Very good point. That's a good point. Yeah, because having lots of certifications tells me one thing. If I'm looking at if I'm looking at a bunch of trainers and I know nothing about them at all, except for their certifications. What your certifications will tell me is what you're interested in and that you took the time to get certified. So if I see that you have, this guy over here has got 15 certifications, this guy over here only has one, and I know nothing else about them, I can safely say, well, that person has taken the time and spent the money to pursue a bunch of education. They're serious about their career. Yes, yes. And I think that's why that's why gyms will, you know, big corporate gyms will 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 reward that. Like a lot of corporate gyms if you work at them, they will give you a raise with each certification many times or levels of certification. And it's because people who tend to, people who have 3 or 4 certifications tend to take their job more seriously than somebody that maybe just has one. And that's, I think, why they they tend to re- reward it now. Well, I think as an employer, I think there's a lot of value to it. But you know, this the specific question here is right. you know, marketability. And I think marketability wise, it doesn't you're marketing make, yourself, right? It doesn't make a it doesn't make a big difference. Your acronyms don't mean shit, right? But I do agree with both of you that I mean, in a in a corporate type environment, and what that says about the trainer and the importance of education and growing hundred percent. I mean, all of us are that way too. Like I I I don't know. It's hard to say now, looking back 15 years, like, did I learn more and did I become a better trainer from all the different certifications that I have? Or did I through, you know, training clients and then because what would happen to me, what I did a lot was I would be training a client and then something like gout. I remember the first time, you know, a client had gout and I was like, fuck, I don't even know what that is, you know, like and then I'd be go, I'd go home and I'd be like researching and mm-hmm. looking it up and the do's, the don'ts and why it's caused. And so and yeah. then I would learn all about it yeah. because I needed to speak to that because I now have a client. So a lot of my education came from those types of things. Now, there were certain certifications that made big difference for me, like NASM was a uh, you know game changer for me because at that point um, I'd never seen such a good assessment tool. Um, we had, we had an okay one that the gym used. And before that I had never seen like a real good squat assessment. And then a tool that showed me like, okay, if their body moves like this, this is why, and this is how you counter that as a trainer. That was of great value to me. Then I started to realize that, um, at least, you know, more than half of the people that I trained were, not like me and they were more like the older population that just wanted to feel good and they dealt with aches and pains and their posture was all fucked up. So I remember going through uh, CES and the value in you know learning about corrector, CES stands for corrective exercise specialist. Uh, that the value that came from that uh, added so much to my arsenal when I or tool belt when I was dealing with clients. So lots of great value came from that. So I think both experience and certifications uh, can help you be a better trainer as far as the marketability piece 
What do you, I mean, I would still think that somebody saying that they're 10 years vested. You know, you know the irony of the funny thing about this is looking fit will probably make you more marketable. Than, yeah, right. Than, than, <laughs> it's true. true. It's true. I hate to say it like- still a standard. It still is, right? If you look a particular way, you're probably going to be more marketable. No, I mean, it lets, uh, that's, it's the reason why I do what I did. I mean, yeah. when I when I turned on my Instagram, the intention was to build a fitness business off of it. Yeah. And the direction I went was watch me transform my body, then watch me compete. Um, I knew damn well that wasn't like a long life passion of mine or I gave two shits about that. I 100% understood the market that I was in. I 100% knew that nobody was going to listen to how smart I was or my experience or all my certifications or all the clients' lives I changed if I looked like shit. So yeah. it was, I'm going to put myself in the most ridiculous shape to get attention and then I could then right, ch- right. change people's minds. I, the most I ever learned in my entire career in, 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 a, in, in a compressed period of time was l- simply from observing other really good yep. instructors and trainers. By far, there's nothing that comes close, like working with physical therapists in my gym, mm-hmm. working with massage therapists in my gym, working with acupuncturists, working with chiropractors, and I'd, I'd observe them and see what they would do and how they communicate, and I'd pick up what they would say, and I'd learn what they would do, mm-hmm. and then I would apply little pieces of it, and it made, I mean, those things, that's how I learned more than anything. Of course, my own application, my own study, but... I worked with a physical therapist for seven years. I learned more about correctional exercise just watching her oh, yeah. help people. It's that applied knowledge. Oh. You just see like how they spot things and um, you know what they put their clients through in order to you know reveal this information. And you're like, wow, I I had never thought to approach it that way. And it, I've always taken way more from observing than I have mm-hmm. just reading something out of a textbook. And I think. It's tough. It's a really tough task to ask somebody to write down all of that knowledge when it comes to the human body because it's so like it's it's two dimensional, you know, and we're three dimensional moving objects. Dude, if you want to if you're a trainer and your goal is to be just a better and better and better and better trainer, both marketable marketability speaking and just as an exceptional trainer for helping people. If you're in a facility and you're the best trainer in there, go find another gym. Mm. Go to another place and make sure you're not one of the best trainers in there. And if you're a growth-minded person, you will you will get a lot better being surrounded by really, really good trainers. Absolutely. But if you're in a situation where you're the- Apprenticeships. Yeah. If you're the best trainer in your gym and you want to grow and learn, it's going to be tough because you're the best person in there. You know what I mean? Who are you going to learn <laughs> yeah. from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next up is Tim414 Mercado. Will your body and metabolism adapt to excess amounts of NEAT the same way it, as it does cardio? Now, I'm glad you picked this. Sal, you picked this, right? I did. So I'm glad you picked this because Lane said something that I wanted to make clear um, with our audience that they understand this uh, because I, I now see that this the word NEAT is starting to take legs uh, in a different way here. And so I just want to be clear on what NEAT technically is. It's the activity that we do that we're, we're not even aware of or that we're not scheduling right as a workout so when we talked sometimes we use how we talk about steps and even how we recommend in map split we use steps as and we put in quote unquote we put that as neat and technically it's not neat because you are actively going to go move and that would that would still fall under exercise Mm -hmm. so i want to be clear that we we've kind of blurred that a little bit to get people to understand uh, kind of what we're trying to get people to do, which is to just, you know, move a little bit more and pay attention to how sedentary they are by focusing on their quote unquote neat. Well, how do you track your neat, right? There, you can't. Yeah, well, steps. Steps yep. is the best way that we know of. That's why we say, man, you know, watch your steps and that'll give you a good idea as to whether which or not Which technically it's not because once you start taking steps and you start actively increasing your steps, it's no longer. Well, neat. this is the, this is the way it needs to be. Okay. So here's why neat is superior to cardio. Uh, there's a few different reasons. One, the metabolism adapting, if you spread and they've, there's, they've done studies on this. If they take, if you take and do an hour of cardio once a day, or you do, you know, 30 minutes of cardio in the morning at night, they'll, they found in studies that splitting up the cardio does a more effective job at burning body fat and, and results in a, in a, less of a metabolic adaptation. So spreading it out throughout the day is just more effective. But that's not really the main reason why we promote NEAT. The reason why we promote NEAT is NEAT is your everyday life. It's it's literally how you are incorporating movement right. into just living. Now, it, it, and we know as trainers that you know if we tell people to do lots of cardio every single day, very few people will be able to maintain that forever. 
But if we teach people to monitor their activity throughout the day, park a little farther with their car, take the steps, you know, get up uh, at your desk every half hour, that kind of stuff, that those things can very easily become you know, habits or become a part of your life. And when something becomes a part of your life, when your life becomes more active, now you're more likely to keep it up and stay consistent. Now, the metabolism adapting part, you know, will it eventually adapt? Probably. But does it make a difference? Not really, because here's the deal. Besides burning more calories than you're taking in and all that stuff, it's good for you to move more. So let's forget about the the fat loss effects for a second, because yes, burning more calories than you're taking in does result in fat loss. But if you're just relying on the burning calories part and you're not speeding up your metabolism, at some point your metabolism may adapt. But forget about that for a second. Even if you're not burning, even if you're just moving more, your metabolism adapted, but you're still moving more, it's better for you. 100% down the road, it is healthy for you to move throughout the day. Like I've, ta- I've brought up uh, you know, studies on hunter-gatherers, modern hunter-gatherers and how active they are and scientists will study them and find that they don't burn that many more calories than the average person because their metabolisms have adapted. And so people might be thinking, well, what's the use then? They're still way fucking healthier. Right. If you're just sitting on your ass and you're you know, burning 2,000 calories or you're moving and you're active throughout the day and you're burning the same amount of calories, it's probably better for you to move for a million and one different reasons, the physical reasons, but also for the psychological reasons of actually moving and getting off your ass. So NEAT is a superior way to you know, manage and monitor your activity rather than not being active all day and scheduling an hour of cardio or whatever. So I I had a conversation very similar uh, around like this question right now. That's uh, so bear with me as I, as I will get there. So yesterday, um, good friend of mine, Jessica, uh, I'm helping her out through uh, her training right now. And she's, you know, the heaviest that she's ever been. And the first month, you know, I told her I want her fed all the time. We're going to try and increase calories. I wanted her steps, you know, because I talked to her about neat all the time. But again, I use steps as the way to kind of measure that. Like Sal was saying, okay, your first month, our goal is to get, stay at around, you know, eight to 10,000 steps per day. And you're going to be training three days a week. She's following the the MAPS program right now. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to see any weight loss from you. That's not the goal right now. So that a lot of the conversation has been around that and making sure that she understands that this is so important right now as we are first starting up. Now she asked me literally yesterday, she goes, you know, um, I love the way I, I can see that even though my weight is not changing, I'm the same weight that I was four weeks ago when we started, you know, we won, we dunked, we, we weighed her and her body fat's down 3% because she's been adding muscle and she is losing body fat, but the scale is staying the same. So she's like, I'm totally happy with what's going on, but I do have Mexico next month. Mm-hmm. And when can I start doing cardio? And I said, well, I don't want you to look at like cardio like that and said, why don't we just increase your movement throughout the day, gradually leading up to that through your knee or through your steps. And I only want you to use a piece of equipment or get on there and do quote unquote cardio if you can't reach those step goals without it. But I would like for you to make the habits throughout your day to hit your step targets without that hitting and getting on a treadmill and actually starting to plug away and increase the intensity to get there. So, you know, I said, okay, well, we've got um, six weeks until you've got Cabo. So what I want to do is, you know, we, we were at eight to 10,000 steps. So next week, 12,000 steps per day. The next week after that, 14,000 steps per day. The next week after that, 16,000. Now what I know, because I've been doing this for a long time, once people start, once I start moving people's steps up from about 16,000 to 20,000, unless you have a very active job, that person will have a hard time getting to 16 to 20 without making a conscious effort to get on a treadmill. Right. That's or, a lot of steps though, right? Yeah, it's a lot of steps. Yeah. And so then, I, and what I told her, I said, so then what I want you to do is that's how you're, you're going to use cardio is to reach your, your target movement for the day. And only if you couldn't do it through just basic- Just your lifestyle. Yeah, lifestyle. Because what I know is if you do it that way, it's way more sustainable when you get to your goal. Sure, I could slam you on the treadmill right now and say, okay, from here till Cabo, I want you to get on the treadmill and go for an hour of cardio. 
every single day from here on that. And yes, we'll burn some fat. Yes, she'll lean out. Maybe, and maybe she'll even lean out a little bit faster doing that than slowly increasing her knee. But what I know is if I can teach her to have better habits of movement throughout her day, it'll seem like she's not having to work anymore, but her body is having to work more. She'll see more overall benefits from her. It'll be more sustainable for her. And then guess what she still has in her back pocket if she needs to use mm-hmm. it or speed something up. And that's what I told her is like, as we get closer to Cabo, we'll reassess where your body is at, where you want to be, and then the final week or two, maybe, maybe I'll allow you to jump on some cars. Exactly, cardio. exactly. I mean, neat is just look. If if something becomes a part of your lifestyle, or it is your lifestyle, you're far more likely to be consistent at it. It's far more likely to yield you, you know, better health benefits, both from a psychological standpoint, because, you know, if you dread getting on the treadmill or dread doing cardio, you may not dread just moving more throughout the day, um, and then spreading it out, you know, from a physiological standpoint, spreading out activity seems to have a better effect on the body, both from a health perspective and from a fat loss perspective. So if your goal is fat loss, you're better off breaking things up and NEAT does that kind of naturally. Whereas cardio, it's much more difficult to do unless you, you know, you have a treadmill in your living room and you work at home and you can jump on there every, you know, every three or four hours type of deal. So, you know, that's, that's the thing. But as far as metabolic adaptation is concerned, Yes, you know, the metabolism tends to adapt, but the best way to alleviate that is to build muscle. So, you know, in, in, in the sense of, you know, if you want a faster metabolism, focus on strength training and then you don't have to worry so much about the metabolic adaptation from cardio. Uh, if the cornerstone of your programming is to build strength, build muscle, and, which requires more calories. And just so, to add to what I'm doing with Jessica to help maybe even give more context to this, something that, again, our goal was to. Um, I want her up closer to like 2,600 calories a day and she's more like 1,800 right now. So what I'm also doing as I'm increasing her need, I'm also increasing her calories. So I don't expect to see any major weight loss because what I'm wanting to do is keeping her fed while she's moving. I want to get her body used to consuming 2,600 calories or so. So if I can do that without putting any bad weight on her by kind of canceling that out through the little bit of movement throughout the day so she doesn't see this big spike in you know weight of, from adding all the extra calories we're in a, an incredible position in the next four weeks if I've got ramped her up to 2400 or so calories from her 18 range mm-hmm. and she's just been walking and moving more and we haven't even really done cardio now as a trainer I got a lot to play with Perfect. right now now I got a good metabolism that I can start to then add. you can cut from that no problem right and then she's still in a great position calorie wise she doesn't feel like she She's starving her body. I can some days do cardio and keep the calories up. I can do some days not do cardio and restrict calories. Lots of options that I can play with to get this person to reduce body fat. Perfect. Hey, what was that site again, Doug, with the free guides? Mind Pump Free. Mindpumpfree.com. Mind Pump Free. I want to remind you guys, mindpumpfree.com. There's uh, free guides, all kinds of guides on there that are free, and we're adding more all the time. Also, you can find us on Instagram. So my page is Mind Pump Sal, Adam is Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.